It's no secret that there is a new Legends expansion that is going to be coming at the end of November. Uh, Return to Clockwork City was announced, and since the initial announcement where they showcased and revealed some of the cards and some of the mechanics that we can expect from that set, um, we've had three more cards that were released or at least revealed that are going to be upcoming in the set. So I wanted to do a quick video to kind of look at the three, talk about you know, potential uses, uh, talk about power level, and, you know, just kind of give my own opinion. Uh, let's, let's just start by saying, one, things can change, right? So I'm going to give my opinion based on the way uh, the current meta is, the way that the game currently plays, and based on the existing cards that we know. So with that caveat, there may be cards that are later revealed that change the value of some of these cards, but um, we can't predict the future, so this is just going to be based on what we know now. So without further ado, let's take a look at the three cards and talk about power level and potential uses. So first up is Starsung Bard. Uh, this was a card that was revealed by Beaky, a content creator for Legends. Starsung Bard is a 3 cost neutral with a 2-3 body and it says that it's immune to silence and your unique cards cost one less. Now on the face of it, again just based on what's been revealed and the way the game currently plays, uh, for constructed play this card is probably not going to make a big impact. Um, it's got two things going for it and we're going to look at each one individually. Uh, the first is Immune to Silence. Immune to Silence can be good. It would be better if the other part of the card it was a more desirable effect. But you could maybe have an argument for trying to throw this into, let's say, like an item-based deck. Where you might be really fearful of silence and you want to just load up creatures and not have silence ruin all your precious item plays. The problem with that, though, is that every deck runs removal. So silence or not... Um, this card does not say immune to removal, it can still be Piercing Javelin, it can still be Lightning Bolted, it can still be uh, Cursed and then Finished Off, Leaf Lurker, so on and so forth. So um, all of the things that you would be fearful of also ruining your big giant item stacked creature still apply. Now the other part of the card is that your unique cards cost one less. So Immune to Silence does protect that, but that in and of itself also isn't that great. So your unique cards costing one less in a neutral color like this um, would imply that you would either want to play a lot of unique cards to get the value from it, or at least have something really key that you wanted to ramp into, uh, more so in, in attributes and colors that don't have ramp, right? At three, you'd probably much much uh, prefer to play like Tree Minder if you're in uh, Endurance, um, because then that ramps you into everything, not just your unique cards. So this is really going to be targeting your non-ramp, non-endurance based decks. And to get as much value out of it as you can, you either want to play something immediately, which means unique cards that cost one, um, so you could play this and then play Shadow Mirror, you could play this and then play Ungulum. Still not that great though. Um, or you're playing it with the hopes that it survives for a turn, and then you get to play a 5 cost unique, um, you know, one turn sooner. Now, the problem with that is that, again, as of right now, just based on what's in print and what's been revealed, there are just simply not enough good 5 cost uniques that are worth running this neutral for, um that you just need to get into play. Uh, a 2-3 body with nothing else going for it just isn't enough impact on the board. You're taking a pretty big tempo loss to set up something that as of right now is just not gonna be like that great. Um, yes, you can play Iron a turn sooner. Yes, you can play a Nasi, Ulfric. Um, there are five cost uniques, but one, Playing them a turn sooner isn't going to make or break a game in many cases. And two, they're uniques, right? There's only one in your deck. So even if you have Starsung Bard, the chances of you guaranteeing that you get the high impact unique that you're playing Starsung Bard for are pretty slim. Even if you cram your deck full of uniques, 
it's not like that great of a card as of right now. So the only way that this card gets better, if we talk about potential uses, uh, there are two. Uh, this card gets better if this uh, upcoming story expansion has a lot of uniques, right? If, if the ability to play a lot of cards based off of this uh, does come up, it might rise a bit in value. Um, the Immune to Silence also is pretty important, potentially, for story mode missions. So where this card actually could shine, in my opinion, would be in the story mode where... If there's a unique gimmick or a unique thing that you need to do to complete the story mode or do something special on like master difficulty um, immune to silence is not on a lot of cards right now and this might actually be a cheeky way to do that so i would say keep an eye out for some of the scenarios in story mode and you know this this might be useful there so uh next up uh, this is a Memory Wraith. This is the card that Justin and I revealed on the podcast, and it started uh, quite the commotion. Uh, Memory Wraith is a 5-cost intelligence creature that is a 5-5, and it says, Summon, banish your opponent's discard pile. So many people are saying that this is like the death of a million different deck archetypes. You know, Ramp Scout is dead because it nerfs Soul Terror and Skeletal Dragon. Um, Stealer Secrets OTK is dead. Uh, because this gets rid of all of the actions, um, item, sorcerer, and other item decks. Uh, Master of Arms is pretty crippled uh, because of this card. Uh, there's a lot of, like, the sky is falling. There's also another camp that says um, that this card is just a 5-5 five, five for 5, more often than not, and it's not going to impact things. Oh, uh, Journey. Journey to Savagard is apparently also unplayable because this card exists. So, where do I think the card falls? Um, I think the card has a, like, a very, like, median power level. I don't think that it's broken. I don't think it's going to warrant a nerf. A lot of people are comparing this to Thief of Dreams because that was a 5-5 five, five for 5 with a powerful effect. And when the devs released their reasoning for nerfing, they said that, uh, you oftentimes have to sacrifice stats for a powerful effect, but... Um, in my opinion, the Thief of Dreams always gave you information, it had a chance to give you card advantage, right, and it could potentially steal you really impactful cards. This does not generate card advantage. It has the potential to cripple your opponent, but one, they have to be playing a deck that can be crippled by it, and two, even if they're playing said deck, Playing this card doesn't guarantee that that deck is not effective, and just even having it in your deck doesn't guarantee it. So first off, let's just say you're playing against, uh, you know, Stealer Secrets OTK, right? Having three of these in your deck doesn't mean that you'll draw it and play it. Also, let's just say hypothetically you're playing this card against Stealer Secrets OTK, right? Um... You're not going to play this card on curve, right? Chances are by the time that you hit 5 Magicka, there's not nearly enough things in their uh, discard pile to warrant playing this. So at this point, this is really like a 5 cost card that's like a 7 or an 8 drop. It reminds me similarly to like Garnag, right? Oftentimes Garnag's best play is like on turn 7 or 8 and not on curve. Um, so it kind of falls in there and... While Garnag can certainly win you some games, um, I think people will also tell you that Garnag can sometimes be lackluster in certain matchups where he doesn't matter, um, oftentimes be like a dead card, and at least Garnag, like a 4-5 for 4 that also has Breakthrough, is still a better stat distribution and ability distribution per cost uh, when compared to just a vanilla 5-5 five, five for 5. Now, let's just say... Uh, that you're playing this card against Ramp Scout, right? Let me let me show you why I think this card is interesting and has some power, but is not broken. If you're playing this against Ramp Scout, and let's say they've got like three creatures in the grave, right? They got a Tree Minder that they played, they got a Giant Bat that they played, and they got a Thorn Hiss Mage that they played, and then they also have a Skeletal Dragon on the board, right? Skeletal Dragon has also buffed the three cards in the grave. You have Memory Wraith. Do you play Memory Wraith now? Because I only have three cards in the in the discard pile. If I play it now, 
then I'm not really stopping a ton of soul tear shenanigans, right? Um, the minute that the skeletal dragon dies, they can still soul tear that. Uh, the minute that they play any other creature, right? They could play a second bat. They could play Tazcad. They could play Parthernax. Um, there's a lot of, you know, high quality creatures that would still be left in their deck that they could soul tear. Red Brahmin. So if I play Memory Wraith now, and it's the only one I have in my hand, um, I would potentially slow them down for a bit, but they're going to play other cards that are going to go in their discard pile and then still be able to abuse them with soul tear right so it's not like a oh i played memory wraith game's over scenario um in many ways the ramp players can also hold soul tear and time things for like they attack and get a value trade and then soul tear right away so even if you do hit a good timed like well targeted hey i banished their discard pile it's not going to necessarily stop soul tear in those scenarios, right? They could play Tazcad, swing it into something, and then immediately soul tear it back, right? You won't even have a chance to respond in some scenarios. Um, but let's go back to that scenario, right? Like, do you play Memory Wraith to get rid of what's in the grave? I mean, it's already been buffed by Skeletal Dragon, but now, like, you have to maybe deal with the Skeletal Dragon. Maybe you hold it and you hope to like javelin the dragon and then play wraith getting rid of everything great but then you still have to deal with everything else that they've played right so in many ways memory wraith is a card that slows down scout potentially but then you still have to finish them off right you still have to take advantage of the fact that you slowed them down there has to be some sort of tempo so you might say okay well then i'll play this in a mid-range deck right great let's think about that right i don't think that you run it in assassin assassin already has a lot of really good five drops um even when thief of dreams was a five five um i wasn't running a full set in assassin because you've got cliff racer you've got leaf lurker um it's it's hard to like fit in um mid mage maybe you can you know fit it into there um, if you're playing the prophecy one, it's going to be hard to justify it over, let's say, like, House Carl, though maybe you do, right? If you're not playing the prophecy one, it's probably, you know, better than your other five drops. I could see it totally going in there. Um, it's just, it's in a weird spot because, again, in many matchups, you're just going to get a 5-5 five, five for 5. And then even in the matchups where you want to disrupt, again, think against items, right? I play Memory Wraith, I get rid of some items, there's nothing stopping my opponent from playing more. And if I'm playing multiple memory wraiths, yes, I'm keeping their discard pile down. I'm keeping that mechanic down. But I'm also just playing five fives for five. So if they're playing better value creatures on the board, then I'm losing that battle. Um, I really feel like the reaction to this card is um, a bit of an overreaction in, in both directions. I don't think that it'll just be a five five as often as people think. Um, and that's not even counting if we see more more discard mechanics. I think there's enough decks that, as of now, because it's been slowly being pushed over time. I think there's enough decks right now that that utilize it that it'll it'll annoy somebody sometimes. Like even if it just stops like Iron from getting value in like a Mage Mirror match, it might be enough. Um, but it also won't just win you games. With the exception of, again, maybe like weird OTK decks like Steeler Secrets where, you know, they're getting close to lethal, you play it, you shut them out, sure. But that's going to be more fringe case than not. It's not like you play this card against Scout and you suddenly win. Um, you could play, I can literally envision a scenario where you could play three memory race against a Scout and they could still generate value. So this is not going to like completely cripple that deck archetype. It will make for interesting um, play and decision making because again, do you play the memory wraith on curve or do you hold it? If you do hold it and you play it, are you preventing the right cards? Um, if you're playing as the scout player, um, can I set up scenarios where I kill things and then immediately soul tear it back? There's going to be this like mental jousting that occurs, um, and I I think that's kind of cool. Now, that being said. We haven't seen all the cards, so if there are more discard pile interactions, uh, similar mechanics, if there are more banish mechanics, that could also change the value of this 
could change the value of other cards but based on uh, just decks as we know it just based on what's been uh, revealed thus far um, I think that this card is interesting but not broken and not you know 100% terrible so uh, I think it's got a nice median value I think that on the ladder when it's a best of one against who knows what and you're gonna queue into anything um, I could see some decks getting value out of this um, depending on what the meta looks like uh, this is this is a tech card and that's exactly what it is sometimes it'll be worth it to tech it in sometimes it'll be worth it to tech, to tech it out right it's not a guaranteed auto include never take it out just win you games kind of card um, this is vicious drag right sometimes you tech it in and sometimes it helps you win and sometimes it comes out so that's how I feel about it um, maybe I'm wrong but I, I think that uh, on paper versus in practice uh, are going to be two different things with this card. So uh, let's move on to the last card. Uh, this was the card revealed by CVH. Um, this is either Mechanar or Messinar uh, with a C. If I had to guess, I'd say like Mechanar. Um, but uh, this is a unique neutral legend. Uh, it's an 8 cost 4 4, and it's got a really cool effect. Uh, anytime I see a unique neutral legend, I kind of stand up and, and take notice because the ability to go in any deck means, you know, you, you got to potentially plan for it when you're playing against any deck. Um, yeah, like unique legends are interesting to me just because they have the potential to fit in a bunch of different archetypes or just not be played at all. Um, and there's kind of a fine line in between, so they're always worth at least looking at. So, that being said, uh, it's an 8 cost 4 4. Stats aren't great for the cost, but uh, the summon effect uh, it says stitch together the top creature from both decks to create an abomination and put it into your hand. Now, the way that this works is it takes the um, highest like uh, cost of the two, right? So, if you have an Odaving and a Nord Firebrand, it's going to cost 12, right? If you have a uh, Underworld Vigilante and a Murkwater Shaman, it's going to cost five. It takes the power and toughness, right, from both creatures, combines them. And then it lets you choose which text box, right? So, again, if you've got an Underworld Vigilante or a Murkwater Shaman, uh, you get to pick one or the other, and then it becomes that. Uh, it also gets the Abomination tag. Uh, now, what's interesting is the cards from the decks are, like, removed. So you are removing a card from your opponent when you play this card. So if you do, like, steal an Odaving from your opponent, it's just like uh, Thieves Guild Shadowfoot, it's stolen, right? Like, they do not get Odaving anymore. It's also interesting because this is not the top card, this is the top creature. So if their deck has, like, three actions on top and then the fourth card down is a creature, it takes that creature... And then if they have more actions below that, you could deny them from getting a creature for a long time. Um, it's also worth noting this is a summon effect. So flicker effects will get that to re-trigger. Things like the, the dragon mask item will get this to re-trigger. Now, uh, the card does go into your hand. So immediately when I see this, right, because it's an 8 cost for a 4-4, four, four, that does not do a whole lot to impact the board. I think that this is likely only going to see playing control. Um, the control effect is actually pretty strong. And I think that if it does see play, it's going to be used as a mirror breaker, right? Like this is the idea of I want to um, deny my opponent their Perthernax and then stitch it together with something of mine, right? Um, I want to deny my opponent their Mirac and then stitch it together with something of mine. So... This is a control versus control card. Um, this is the sort of thing, in my opinion, you include if if the meta starts going greedier and greedier and greedier, this is a great card for out-greeting your opponent. Um, traditionally, other cards that have been used to out-greed your opponent have been things like Dark Rebirth, A Night to Remember, even Close Call. Um, all of those cards can still be used to out-greed your opponent, and they combo with this guy, right? So... Um, this is just a tool to outgreed your opponent, in my opinion. Um, it will make for some pretty cool highlight reels. Um, even if you're playing control, but you're playing against aggressive decks, 
Um, the ability to like give you a big charge creature can sometimes make or break a game. Um, to give your creature with drain even additional stats could be pretty big. Um, you think about something like um, Control Crusader, right? You could play this at 8, and if Ravenous uh, Hunger pops up for you, and even just like a 3-3 three, three for your opponent, right? You stitch them together, you pick Ravenous Hunger. Um, now you've got a 7-4 that on turn 9 you can play with Unstoppable Rage from hand, and so instead of, you know, gaining 4 health per creature and wiping a lane, you're now going to potentially gain, you know, 7 and wipe a lane. So this leading into that on curve, um, you know, those kinds of plays might arise. Um, but again, I, I think that this is pretty much a control card. I don't think it's an auto include. I think that you're going to kind of wait and see what the meta dictates because um, it doesn't impact the board and the 4-4 is not great. So you need to be in a place where you can take the tempo loss when you play it. Um, so kind of uh, more than likely dead against aggressive decks. Um, Mid-range decks, it might matter depending on what you get and what you stitch, and could be a great card for breaking control mirrors and giving you a little bit of an edge. So uh, that's what I feel about this card. Um, again, based on what's been revealed so far, and you know what cards already exist, what the meta looks like today. So uh, things could change. Um, I'm not uh, somebody who can see the future. Um, could be entirely wrong about all three of these cards, but that would be my assessment. Um, let me know what you think. I'd like to know what your opinions are uh, about any of the cards. I suspect that Memory Wraith is going to be the the big talking point because it already kind of has been. Um, but I'd love to know what you think about the unique neutral. Um, heck, if you think I'm wrong about Starsung Bard, let me know. Uh, as always, I love you guys. Thanks for watching, and until next time, may you walk on warm sands.